your YouTube channel, Less Impressed, More Involved. One of the best titles I think I've ever come across or just names for a channel, I think. Thanks, man. Super cool. It came from Matthew McConaughey. Oh, okay. It's in his, his book, yeah. Yeah, I love that. He just, he just basically said, like, if you like something, stop being impressed by it and just get involved in it and start learning about it because, you know, there's a science behind it pretty much and you can, you can learn it. Jake Luigi is the mind behind the less impressed, more involved video blog on YouTube. In less than a year, I saw his channel grow from a few hundred to almost 8,000 subscribers at the time of this recording. Some of his most popular videos have amassed 60,000 views and continues to grow due to his cerebral, detailed, and cataloged approach to learning the art, the language, and the endless evolution of jujitsu. In a time that has never seen more opportunity than today for creative exploration and exchange of ideas, I hope that conversations like this offer some insight for those that want to invest in themselves, their life's work, and the most genuine expression of themselves to what I believe will be the future of designing a flexible lifestyle in creating content for an open and shared information economy. Like you can either blame schools for not teaching you finance or you can go out and learn finance. Having having no mentor or having like a, a decent mentor but you like want more is like a good it's almost good for your long-term growth, I feel like, because it forces you to go out and like find answers yourself instead of relying on someone to constantly give you the answer, you know? Greetings, and welcome to the Quake City Portal. My background of toiling around professional kitchens, training as a hobbyist triathlete, and peeking in and out of training rooms of jiu-jitsu academies in the Bay Area has helped me discover my love for learning, communicating, and teaching in the most effective ways possible. I've been a latecomer to most things in my life. I'm often disappointed to hear that mastery is for those that started early and envious of those that do. Now that I've realized that, although it's commendable to achieve mastery at something, the focus of when or where or how you started is what hinders the learning. The enjoyment of learning is fulfilling in itself. I love learning from people. But of all the reasons I continue to do this podcast, and I've thought about whether I should continue this or not, I do this to work on my communication, my listening, and how clearly I convey ideas in real time to another person. It's important to me. My goal, to put it simply, is to talk and write better, which is why I wanted to have this conversation and conversations like this. Although Jake is still in the beginning stages of his channel, I found in watching his videos, I become curious as to how much history and depth he draws from when he communicates an idea. When I watch his videos, I recall how I've seen chess masters remember positions on a chessboard when playing blindfolded, or how a basketball player remembers certain situations throughout his career uh, in vivid detail. Uh, or how some people have a backlog of quotes and an inventory of intricate stories to draw from to suit any given situation. So if you nerd out like I do on creative processes, uh, writing and note-taking techniques, or how to take in as much information as possible, this conversation covers all of those, and I hope to get into more of that in future episodes. So just a heads up, this conversation has many jujitsu references but I believe it's a metaphor slash fill in the blank for learning and mastery. Jake's approach to creating content presents a great insight into how to arrange a vast amount of information, how to organize it and package it in a practical way that delivers value for those seeking improvement, to be less impressed and more involved in our pursuits. I hope with these intentions that you find much to take away from this conversation and past conversations as I have, and to please check out his channel, Less Impressed, More Involved, on YouTube. Yeah, um, I just wanted to start off because I think the last time you and I spoke, um, you mentioned that you started an agriculture farm out of your... (laughs) out of your out of your bedroom or was it your your studio or 
even a van? Did you even live in a van? I remember you mentioned that too. You know, I, I did the, the kind of corporate thing for a while in, uh, in the Bay Area. And the first time I quit my job, my plan was with my roommate um, to sell all of our furniture in our living room and do a vertical farming system for sprouts, mm. like microgreens. And uh, to make that feasible and lower my expenses, I decided to live in a van. Um, so I was living in a van and we were growing microgreens out of the living room of an apartment um, was the way we, we went about it. And we were selling them at um, like farmer's markets and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was, where that was you, the plan. Where did you get that idea from? Um, we heard someone um, on Joe Rogan. Her name is Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Have you, have you mm. heard her? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and she was talking about broccoli sprouts. Mm -hmm. So we decided to use mason jars and grow some broccoli sprouts for ourselves, um, mm -hmm. just for our own consumption. Cause that's how she recommended that you do it. And yeah. then we would, it would take like a week to grow broccoli sprouts and the amount we were growing would only last us like a day or maybe two. Um, so we decided to upscale our operation and in our research that we were doing on how to upscale that operation, we saw people making a decent amount of money using a vertical farming approach to their, their growing. So, um, that kind of planted the seed pun and pun intended. And, uh, yeah, it kind of grew from there. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, I'm excited for our conversation. I, I really enjoy talking to you. You were, you were like one of my if not my favorite person to train with at, at the cave. I always enjoyed training with you. Yeah. Right on, man. I appreciate that. Thanks for the kind words. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I was, I was a newcomer to the gym and you know, I've never, I've never been um, a newcomer to a gym in, I don't know. And probably like I trained for like a good five years without being a newcomer at a gym and I was always a white belt. So it's easy to just forget about white belts. Right. So, um, yeah, seeing you there definitely made it so much easier. When did you first start training at the cave? I started training in the summer last year. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I was doing, I was training to run ultra marathons and then, uh, I got sick of that. <laughs> I got burnt out super quick. And then I started watching jujitsu videos again, and I was just like, I got to get back into this. It's just too fun to stay away from for a long time. So did you train for like five years and then COVID hit? And then that's what kind of sparked your interest in ultra marathons? And yeah. Got it. That's exactly what happened. Uh, and then I also just felt like I needed some headspace to just be by myself for a while. Because, you know, jujitsu, you're just around so many people all the time. And just processing a lot of personal stuff and people's, <laughs> you know, personalities all the time. It can get overwhelming. Even now for me training at the, at where, where we used to train at the cave, um, you know, nothing personal against anybody. I just appreciate my like solitude time. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And running definitely provides that for sure. Yeah. 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 So I, um, I guess going back to the agriculture farm, what made you stop doing that? Um, it just wasn't, um, so I had to quit my job. Right. And mm -hmm. like, without getting too down the like financial path, yeah, I basically had like six months before I would forfeit like all of my retirement money mm -hmm. that I had, not all of it, but like the vesting schedule, blah, blah, blah. Um, mm -hmm. so basically I had like six months, um, where I was like trying to make this work and, um, it ended up being not as like it didn't grow as fast as I would have ho hoped. And then on top of that, I was doing jujitsu like full time at that point mm -hmm. at another school. Um, and it just kind of opened my eyes a little bit because before I had quit, I was always stressed at work, but then outside of work, I was like really like looking forward to weekends and was able to enjoy that time outside of work. But during work was very stressful. And yeah. when I was doing jujitsu and the microgreens thing and living in a van, it was pretty much the opposite. Like during work, I was excited. I was doing jujitsu. I was, you know, growing microgreens and, and whatever. I was 
I was really enjoying what I was doing, but outside of that, it was very stressful, like finding health insurance and like, you know, just like worrying about how you're going to pay your bills. And like, yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that goes into living, you know, yeah. um, which you didn't really have to worry about in the corporate world. So mm. that definitely opened my eyes a little bit to that. And now that I'm doing it again, I think what I kind of took away from that um, is to not put yourself in a situation where you are reliant on like the money that you're getting from whatever you're doing, you know, because yeah. um, I, I heard one story as well um, involving a jujitsu school where this professor kept this guy around, even though he knew that the guy was trouble. And the reason he did that was because the guy had two kids and the school was just getting up and running and he needed the guy there so to basically pay the bills, right? That's like three students there Damn. and he needed, he needed to keep them. And after a few years, the school had gathered more students, right? Yeah. And the professor ends up kicking out this guy who he knew all along was not a good person to be in the school. And eventually he kicked him out. But by then the guy had developed relationships and was involved in the school, you know? So he oh, took shit. it very personal that he was kicked out of the school. Yeah. And he tried to join a couple other schools. They kicked him out right away. Didn't want anything to do with him. And then he came back and ended up shooting the professor that kicked him out. Whoa. Yeah. Where so, was this? It was just a story. I don't know. I don't even remember who said it, but it was like on a video that I was just watching and I heard this. Oh, and for whatever reason, it really resonated me, be, resonated with me because the whole reason that he kept him like at the school to yeah. begin with was because of financial needs. Right. So right. like, I don't know. I just, I just felt like if I'm ever going to do something like this again, I need to have my financial basis covered a bit. Um, so I'm not making all of my decisions strictly based on money, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the worst possible situation. I mean, I feel like a lot of people live that way. Exactly. Right. And they are having your ducks in order before you go pursue, uh, you know, even having kids, even <laughs> it's just right. like, dude, I, I commend people. I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing to get up every day in the morning and then, you know, you have a kid and then you have to stay at this job that you hate, you know, and people do it every day, but I'm glad, you know, your generation, we're like 10 years apart, right? You're like not even 30 yet. You're barely yeah, almost 28. 30, mm -hmm. 28. Yeah. So I'm glad your generation has uh, at least the resources to like rethink that kind of stuff, you know? Right. It's definitely uh, a, a privilege to yeah. have that decision for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So that was what sparked you to rethink your whole business model as far as uh, the agriculture farm goes. Yeah, so I ended up um, going back to my same job I had before. Yep. Um, did that for a few more years. And I actually met um, my girlfriend, who's my fiance now, um, Oh, congratulations. When, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. I met her like when I had just said that I was going back to my job. Oh, shit. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I was still living in a van and everything. <laughs> and uh, but I just kind of decided that I was going to go back down the, yeah. the career path. And I met her. And then after a few more years there, she was the one who really wanted to get out of the get out of the state. And we vacationed here um, on the island of Lanai and really enjoyed it and knew they had a golf course here. And she um, just applied as kind of a joke. And then here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So does, does she have the same like aspirations as you or values? Like, is she hoping to somehow, I guess, what I'm getting a sense from you is that you're hoping to capitalize on your passions, I guess, even if it means living more of a simple life and, and, and just scaling back your, I guess, 
how do you how do people say it um they're living not living standards but basically not living beyond your means right um, right does she does she have that same kind of goal for herself too or yeah you know growing up my parents always called me cheap and yeah. uh, i've always been cheap and yeah. when they met her they mm-hmm. thought that i like rubbed off on her but she was <laughs> like that before she met me you know so like we always like we'll drive up to tahoe and we would go skiing and stuff and we would sleep in our car and mm-hmm. bring a bunch of blankets and then mm-hmm. you know ski two days instead of one try and make yeah. it as financially feasible as possible and um she's 100 percent on board with all the crazy ideas i have which yeah. is which is pretty encouraging i just think um like like i know it's it's very i'm in a very privileged mm-hmm. like place to make this decision right but i just think that we live in such an amazing time where you can learn so many things go to so many places mm-hmm. and the first time I quit my job, it was right after a retirement party. And like the average employee had been at the company for like 14 years or something ridiculous like that. And this specific guy was there for like 35. And I was like looking at him and I was like, dude, I do not want to be here when I'm 55, 60, you know? And uh, yeah, so I just think like my purpose or like my my goal, like what drives yeah. me is to just like develop skills that are useful that I think are useful. Like I'm not going to spend 25 years doing something that I don't even really like, you know, or I don't even think is useful. I'm just doing it to support my family, which like you said, a lot of people have to do. And I realize I'm very lucky to make that decision. Um, But yeah, I think like right now I'm just trying to, to learn as many things, develop skills that I think have use Mm -hmm. um, and that people find valuable and then, and then share that knowledge with, with people. Mm Mm-hmm. That's the same thing that I got into um, in my early 20s with culinary school. Right. Is like my dad gave me the advice. It was either go to music school or, you know, uh, learn how to cook, which I did not know shit about cooking. But I knew, you know, I wanted to pursue like something creative. But then, you know, we're talking about like, I remember you mentioned in your LinkedIn, uh, it was a like a flexible lifestyle right and i thought being a chef would allow you know and it does you can travel anywhere in the world you can cook anywhere in the world and live anywhere in the world and you can cook right but on the flip side of that it's like i started my own business too just like you and i figured out like this is not freedom this is more self-imposed slavery Mm -hmm. (laughs) if i could put it in you know yeah I, I, there's, I know there's a better term for that, but no, my, that's... my dad owns a restaurant and he told me to oh. stay far away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think I remember talking to you about yeah. that too. So yeah, that's cool. So your parents didn't really focus those kinds of things on you as far as career, career advancement, things like that. Go to college. I'm, I'm sure you went to college, right? Yeah, I did. And honestly, like the first time I left my job, my parents were not supportive of it at all. And I'm, mm. I was kind of like, I was always like the good kid growing up, you know, and, and kind of, I think had a set of expectations upon me and I yeah. had a really good job and it was like, why are you giving all this up kind of thing? You know, like we literally invested so much time into you. You went through college. You're like, and now you're going to leave all this to grow microgreens and live in a van. Like, are you freaking kidding me? Um, so the, the support was definitely not there the first time. And I think the plan was, is much better this time. So that was kind of the, the kicker that made us, um, accept moving over here to the Island was that my parents were supportive this time around. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with, with, um, my girlfriend. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks to your girlfriend too for uh, yeah. for for letting Jake do this. The real MVP. <laughs> yeah, 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 the real. <laughs> but uh yeah, and you know, I you're in terms of that lifestyle of like living in a van, I've never come across it until I was in my early to late 30s, to mid 30s, 
and traveling you know you're in jujitsu for a long time or if you're in jujitsu long enough you start seeing like whoa people live in gyms you know um sometimes people live out of their car um or you know if they're privileged enough they have something bigger like an suv or a van right right? um and and i noticed that the climbing community has that exact same there's like a word for it jake if you can help me out there's like a Mm -hmm. Like if you're a savant or something like that, or somebody who just like devotes themselves to like one single thing. Right. And I just thought that that was such a like, whoa, you know, like you skipped a career, you skipped a, you, you, you're doing what you love by any, surfers do it too. Right. right? For sure. By, by any means necessary. And I don't think a lot of people are exposed to that kind of thing to where it's like, whoa, uh, you know, you can do what you love and skip that whole uh (laughs) that whole rat race for lack of a better term and and just learn learn things right right but Uh, yeah yeah like along along those lines i one thing that i kind of took away um like there there is kind of value in the rat race at least for me because like mm -hmm. that put me in a position where like i don't i don't feel like i have to take a lot of risks you know like, I yeah. feel like there is something to admire for those people who like, just say, screw it. I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> I'm just going to like, you know, drive through a brick wall and live in my car and just like, you know, just make it happen, which is for awesome, sure. you know, but at the same time, it's like, you, you don't have to take all those risks, you know, you don't have to quit your job. You can do it on weekends, you know, until you're yeah. able to make it work for like a, make yourself a stable income and then you know, build it from there. Um, but yeah, I think for me, at least the, the rat race kind of gave me the foundation and then hopefully able to, um, avoid it for the rest of my yeah, life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right on. I, yeah. I, yeah, I, I agree too. There's a healthy balance, you know, maybe who knows if I was like so much younger, I might not be singing that tune, you know, I might just be like, fuck it. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but no, it's anyway, super cool. Like yeah. there's just different approaches, you know, like some people use their twenties to figure out what they want to do and then do that forever. And then like, for me, I feel like I used my twenties to be in the rat race and give myself a, a base. And then now hopefully I'm able to use that as a, a springboard into figuring out what I, what I want to do, you know? I guess like, yeah, that's, that's what the twenties are all about. You got to like appease like your parents maybe and right. your friends and show everybody that you're doing all right. And then it's just like, what's the point, you know, <laughs> like, much, yeah. your YouTube channel, less impressed, more involved. One of the best titles I think I've ever come across or just names for a channel. I think Thanks, man. super it came, cool. It came from Matthew McConaughey. Oh, okay. It's in his, his book. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. He just, he just basically said like, if you like something, stop being impressed by it and just get involved in it and start learning about it. Cause you know, there's a science behind it pretty much. And you can, you can learn it. The channel is just, it's grown fast. I mean, towards the end of the last, like last year, you were like, all right guys, let's try to get a thousand (laughs) subscribers towards the end. And then like, it just boomed right after that. It was pretty, pretty wild. Yeah. The recent growth has been, has been really good. The support has been pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's just like evidence of that there is, that there's definitely a demand, um, for videos like yours. And then you're also serving a community of people who love to learn. I think jujitsu essentially is like, you're pretty much learning. Anybody that sticks around is learning for a life, lifetime. For sure. Right. Yeah. So what do you think uh led to the growth of your channel basically you know you mentioned your girlfriend earlier but the content i'm sure is what you're providing that yeah you know thanks to her i'm able to provide consistent videos now whereas previously it was just kind of like one-offs every now and then so that's a huge part of it um and then like specifically i just made like I've tried to avoid making like clickbaity titles, <laughs> but like I just went for it um, on one of them and it kind of made some people upset, but that's been like my most successful video, you know? So um, that one has like almost 60,000 views now. 
and my next closest one is like half of that, you know? So, um, yeah, no, I think, uh, one, it's just being more consistent with it and just being able to provide like, or put time into it, you know, um, thanks to, to my living situation now. And, uh, two is kind of creating more controversial, (laughs) uh, content, you know, I mean, it just kind of is what it is, the nature of the beast, but, um, yeah, try try to avoid that as much as possible. Were you just tr- trying different ideas before this channel came to fruition? Like, were you trying to do other stuff besides jujitsu? Yeah. So, um, like I like I said, I f- like my kind of goal behind it was to be like a journal, um, and I want to learn like a lot of other stuff, not just jujitsu stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And the reason I made the channel was actually. Um, because my girlfriend and I were getting into hunting at the time and I needed to learn a lot of knots, like how to tie different knots, um, for like backpacking situations. Yep. Um, so the channel was just a way for me to make knot tying videos and then a quick <laughs> way for me to reference those knot tying videos when I needed them. Right. If I forgot how to tie a bowline knot, I'd be able to look at my bowline knot video mm-hmm. kind of thing. That was the idea. And then um, like over COVID, I wanted a way to stay engaged in jujitsu. So I started making jujitsu videos as well. And the jujitsu videos were way more popular than the knot tying videos. So <laughs> now we're a hundred percent jujitsu oriented channel, but yeah, cool. no, I mean the, the idea was just like a journal for me yeah. um, over COVID was the, was the idea. How do you think it's been received by the community? Uh, do you feel like it's mostly white belts, blue belts, or do you get a range of like all, the whole spectrum? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think I receive like the whole spectrum of audience. Um, and I honestly am trying to cater my videos more towards the higher level people. Just because for me, like I said, the, the goal was for it to be a journal for me. And I don't want to spend a bunch of time going over like basic concepts because Mm -hmm. for me, it's not as beneficial, right? I prefer to basically my, my process is I will get like inspiration from different instructionals, different YouTube videos, different um, Instagram videos, and then just try and connect as many dots as possible and then look at different matches that, professionals are doing and see what techniques are working at the highest level and then see what like how they chain those links together if that makes sense Mm -hmm. chain those attacks together chain the escapes together whatever they're they're Mm -hmm. doing so um that's kind of my process is to just see what works at the highest level and try and emulate that you know yeah yeah i think the if i were trying to grow the channel as fast as possible i think it would be a smart idea to cater the content towards beginner people because that's going to spread the widest uh like reach right but Mm -hmm. for for me for the purpose that i'm trying to achieve i just want to you know get better and yeah for me to get better i have to push my own limits and it doesn't involve you know slowing down to try and help people which i mean it it is what it is you know i I don't know yeah they'll eventually find it i mean (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah, and one thing that i don't get and what i'm very impressed by is some of the videos that you put out are super dense with clips from other videos. And you mentioned that you digest clips from Instagram um, and other sources, uh, other instructionals. And then you you go in and you, you pull film from actual matches. So I'm super impressed at how you organize your information and ideas. Like how, 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 do, you, how do you do that? Do you take a journal? Do you, what is your, what are your tools that you use for those? Honestly, I think a lot of it has to do with, it's all I have to worry about, you know, like I don't, (laughs) I don't have any other responsibilities really, you know? So I think it's, it's easier for me to stay organized, um, in that sense. But, um, basically all I do is I'll say like, there's an, there's an event coming up on Sunday. Um, yep. Mike, I'm sure you saw is, is in. Um, Mexico, yeah. yeah. So uh, there's an event on Sunday. I'll watch that whole event 
And as I'm watching a match, I'll type in my notes. I'll say like arm drag at 30 minutes into the thing from half guard. And I'll have like a arm drag section in my notes. And then 30 seconds later, there'll be like a mount escape. And I'll just like write in my mount escape section, I'll write mount escape. And then I'll put like the time and then like the video link. So now as I go back to my notes, I'll see like, okay, I have like 50 clips in this mount escape section. (laughs) Maybe I should start to do a mount escape video, you know? Yeah. That's been my process. And then I'll start to just look at all the clips. And then as I rewatch all of those clips of mount escapes, I'll start to see like connections and overlap between the different escapes and different things I want to emphasize in the video based on the overlap that I see when professionals are doing this escape, you know? Right. So that that's kind of where I get my content and video ideas. A lot of time I don't even know like what I'm going to talk about. I just mm-hmm. know I'm going to be talking about a Kimura because I have like 50 Kimura clips that I have documented and then we'll yeah. figure out what the video is going to be on when I see the overlap between all the, all the clips. Right. And yeah. so it sounds like, okay, because you're just doing that for one event and have you been doing that since, I don't know, do you have a back catalog of years for doing this? Cause you're pulling these, these things for multiple years. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the nice thing is there's never a shortage of content, right? So yeah. like, Like literally if I'm, if I'm just watching an event, I'll go back and watch EBI like five from like, you know, 2012 and -hmm. there'll be tons of stuff in there. And like, yeah, it's it's just, it's just awesome, honestly. And, and the people I study, um, are typically Gordon Ryan and like that whole crew. And a lot of their matches are earlier matches, especially in like those EBIs and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and generally there that's where i find a lot of my um the content i use in in my videos even when we're training right um do you take notes after class you know i think if you've been around jiu-jitsu long enough i think everyone's tried to do like a journal thing right like i'm sure you've tried right i yeah i do i still do i still do do you okay yeah Mm -hmm. how do you how do you do it Okay, so the way I write out my, I used it used to be like a a huge clusterfuck of uh, different, you know, I'm trying to explain things step by step. Right now that I'm kind of more experienced and I've written these things and I just put it into practice. I feel like I just remember it a little bit more. But what I do is I'll just be like, okay, um, let's say we start from mount and then it's like from bottom mount and then I'll write a slash. Um, And let's say if it is a mount escape, right? So from bottom mount slash hands on hips slash hip escape, trap the leg slash, you know, I'll just go through different positions. And then if it leads to attacks, I'll just write a branch, like an outline of like, a you know move a like how mike teaches his class is like there's so many variations stemming from one position so i'll just write branches from that one idea you does that make sense jake you there yeah sorry oh All sorry right, about right. that so the way i i heard um the way mike teaches his class there's so many variations and okay, then i so, broke up yeah like let, let's say mike teaches something from um any position, you name it. Uh, He'll show subsequent moves from that position. And then I'll just, yeah, I'll just branch off um, at like, like writing an outline for an essay. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. 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 So it's like idea number one and then branch off from, and that's how I write it. I don't write pictures or anything like that unless it's really intricate. Do you go back and reference it? I do. I, I try to set aside some time when I'm, when I have time and when I've given myself the time to, um, just go back. I'll even, I have, yeah, I think I've, I've done it throughout my whole, uh, since I started. So you definitely find it valuable, right? If you continue to do it, you definitely find it. it Yeah. And I also, I also feel like it's a, it's like a practice in, um, communication because I, I also would love to just teach, and I don't just want to teach jujitsu. I'm 
kind of like you. I like learning different things. And I feel like teaching is a skill that you have to develop, especially in the way you communicate things. And if you can't communicate things in a very clear way, uh, and I think it all stems from writing and going down a rabbit hole of, of writing your ideas down. I've never been a really great talker. I remember telling you like, my, I want to start a podcast and my whole, <laughs> my whole goal is just to talk like John Danaher. Right. <laughs> you know, and seriously, I, the way, the way he communicates is just, it's, it's next level. I don't know. Yeah. That's so, yeah. Do you do, you, you don't. I, you know, I've gone through phases. I have never found them that, that helpful for me. Um, like, like you said, I think the way I, I started to use them was that I really like the way Mike structures his class. And if my ultimate goal is to be a teacher of jujitsu, the way I was journaling would, is what I would like basically focus more on the structure of each class as opposed to the like diving deep into the technical aspect of it. If that makes sense. Like today we did, you know, a side mount escape. So our first situational sparring was from side mount where they started with all of the like inside position. And then we worked backwards and did like side mount, but they have an underhook and then you got to like control the position or whatever, you know? Mm. So like it was more structure based as opposed to, technical based on how to do um Mm -hmm. techniques because honestly i i feel like like michael probably tell you the same thing like the the like fun he he just had an instagram post actually the fundamentals that he taught you know three years ago are completely different than the fundamentals he teaches now so the idea is that the techniques that i'm probably going to teach in five years are going to be different than what we're learning now right so it's not that big of a deal if i get every fine detail right it's Mm. a more bigger like the bigger picture is that you get the structure of the class down and how to teach right um is kind of what i was taking notes on um and that was my mindset behind behind why i was doing that whoa so you were taking notes on how mike or any instructor teaches right it was more about the, the process and the structure of the class as opposed to the technical aspect of the position that we were doing. Okay. Yeah. Have you uh, had a chance to train with uh, any other of the, like the Danaher death squad dudes? No, <laughs> no. I'm yeah, just, yeah. Uh, just an average guy. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Which is, it's I'll, super weird. Like you'll, I'll get people like commenting on my like posts and stuff. <laughs> and it's like, like for me, like, especially living here, it's like, I'm not able to actually do jujitsu as much as I want, you know? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's going to be like, it's difficult for me to study this stuff all day and then not actually get to hone in my skills, you know? So I feel like the bridge between knowledge and like skill development is severely lacking for me, right? Mm. That's going to be my my biggest thing is how do I transfer knowledge into skill? And yeah, it's, it's that's the that's the biggest thing right now that I'm struggling with here. Um like applying applying the things that you're learning and observing into right, or just like not feeling like I'm uh like I'll get I'll get people asking me like, "Oh, what belt are you? Oh, what like is, like, have you trained with like these types of people and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, I'm just like an average dude who's just like <laughs> watching videos, you know, like I don't, I don't have any credentials or anything, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the fact that I'm not really able to train as much as I would like to now, it just like, like if I were to show a move, I wouldn't necessarily be able to perform it as well as I know it should work, if that makes right. sense. So if right. I'm trying to convince a black belt who's been like doing jujitsu for 20 years, that this is like the new way to do a triangle or whatever. And I'm not like that crisp with it. He'll be able to beat me, you know, like he won't, it yeah. won't work on him, but it'll work on the white belts. It'll work on the people that, that don't like know how to defend positions as well. But the only reason it doesn't work on the black belt is because my skills aren't there, right? It's a better technical 
like it's a better way to technically perform the move but i don't know it well enough to convince you of that does that make sense so like it kind of just loses all my uh my credibility a little bit Mm -hmm. but (laughs) also there's also a, a sense that i've heard somebody say this too that everybody knows the same moves most for the for the most part as at least the fundamental moves but it's the timing and and the little nuances of 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 executing that move in real time that right. make the differences between a black belt and a blue belt yeah i guess there's right. so many there's so much yeah i guess what they call it is uh, invisible invisible jujitsu yeah um but anyway i'm i'm in no place either to to talk any right any expertise for i um, i do feel like like a lot of the timing stuff comes from you know like actually doing the the techniques but mm -hmm. the one way that um i've started to kind of like practice timing by not necessarily doing the techniques is trying to look for little cues so that's a good way to explain this so like like if if we're in a race right Uh and you're faster than me but i'm able to say go it gives me an advantage right yes so the way that i'm trying to like i think what what makes a black belt a back black belt is that they're not responding to opportunities that come they're creating those opportunities right which makes their timing look like they're like really good and fast right but it's just because they're creating that opportunity so they know when the timing is going to happen does that make sense so like the way i see like i'm trying to see like what setups they use for the move so like if Mm -hmm. if you're going for a arm bar and my timing is when your hand like touches the mat what am i gonna do to make your hand touch the mat you know Mm -hmm. so as soon as it touches then i'm already grabbing it so the race is like it starts when my like butterfly hook elevates you because that's when your hand's gonna touch the mat Mm -hmm. so i'm elevating you to start the race and now i'm already beating you because my hand i'm taking your hand because i know it's gonna be there does that make sense right yeah so like yeah definitely the timing is you saying go so you determine the the pace of the match Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm trying to to pick up on more in videos is how to like time moves better mm-hmm. and like set up moves better pretty much. Um, but yeah, just trying to be a little more creative because yeah, it's just, it's tough not being able to do it yourself as much as you want <laughs> <Yeah>. to. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you believe in uh, practicing visualization? I, I do that a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Especially now trying to just like visualize, um, moves but like yeah i think i think at the end of the day it's uh i'm I'm, uh, there's books on this i need to read i'm sure you you know more about it than i do um but uh yeah i i definitely think there's value in it but i think the ultimate um like there's no replacement for actually doing something i feel like you know for sure for sure for sure but in, in i do i do I do practice visualization. Uh, I just learned that, you know, I mean, I read somewhere, probably Michael Jordan did it. Uh, there's a really cool climber. Um, his name's Adam Andra. How do you, are you aware of Adam Andra? No, I'm not. So he's one of the, he's one of the most high level climbers in the world. Um, and He's known for climbing some of the hardest routes, putting up some of the hardest routes, creating routes um, in natural settings. And before he actually attempts these routes, um, sometimes he'll do it in one try and he'll observe, like, let's say, are you familiar with rock climbing at all? I've seen documentaries, right? Like okay. The, the yeah, yeah, famous yeah. Famous ones, yeah. So a lot of like the elite level climbers will just look at a route, a climbing route, and they'll know the sequence of moves that it'll take to get from the bottom to the top or wherever it tops out. This guy will not only visualize the the moves, like let's say it's even a cave that even, you know, you climb and there's like underclings where you're hanging pretty much like on the ceiling. Great. He'll visualize it while he's on the floor, every single move, and he'll do every single move. 
and he's known for like yelling and he'll even do the yelling. Um, <sighs> that's how far he goes into the meditation of his visualization. And I know a lot of like top level athletes uh, practice it. So, I mean, you know, uh, I do it to calm my nerves in tournaments because I mean, I, yeah, I am always thinking of variations. I'm always thinking of just trying not to be caught by surprise if anything happens. I'm always thinking right. of the worst case scenario. Yeah, I mean, going back to your channel, um, how have you handled the 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 spurt in growth? Has that been a challenge? Um, it has a little bit, um, in the sense that, like, you know, at, at first, like, I have to be very a lot more careful with my words in the sense that like if I'm showing a defense to something and someone does the wrong defense and I show that in my video and say like, Hey, don't do this. You know, like I can't say like, Hey, don't be an idiot and do this. You know, I, cause that guy might very well be watching the video, you know, like I've had people reach out to me and say like, Hey, you showed my clip here. And like, yeah, that kind of thing. So like, um yeah it's 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 pretty wild you know in the mm -hmm. sense that like yeah i was just doing this for myself and now like the people who are competing are like watching the videos so um yeah it just i just have to be a little um more like just respectful i guess of uh of people and just realize that i'm not doing this just for my own you know um observation and i'm doing it for a community now that um yeah that has value in, in the content and i need to to just kind of be aware of that you know mm -hmm. um so i do kind of just find myself speaking a little more relaxed in a setting where i should be like definitely like respectful of the people that are you know right um but it's it's just weird because like you're in like i'm in a room by myself speaking into a mm -hmm. microphone and people in Europe are going to watch this, you know, it's just like, still blows my mind. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one thing. Um, but honestly, the, the support has been so amazing. It's, it's really cool that, that this is becoming a thing that could potentially be a career, you know? Wow. Wow. And so, yeah, I guess this endeavor for you has helped out your flexible helped you make a flexible lifestyle people yeah for you're, sure you're you're finding support i mean it, is it just from patreon mostly or i guess youtube's youtube is able to um you're able to monetize the 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 videos on youtube yeah most most of it's coming from i mean it's not a lot right but like mm -hmm. um youtube starts to pay you after you get to a thousand subscribers mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Like you said, I, I hit a thousand and then within a few weeks I had like almost 5,000. So, and now it's like almost 6,000. So the growth has been like exponential. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it slowed way down, but, but still it's, it's pretty awesome. The amount of support. And like you said, it's definitely allowed a more flexible lifestyle, which is really important here on this Island. Cause there's not a lot to do and like yeah. people want to visit and um, I'm like a part-time tour guide and, uh, <laughs> oh, cool. do the YouTube thing too. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's definitely, definitely nice for sure. Yeah. Now that you've established your YouTube channel and you're devoting your time to it, like you mentioned, like I said, flexible lifestyle, um, what's your version of it? What's your version of a <laughs> flexible lifestyle? Man, I, uh, there's, there's some cool things to do on the island. Like there's, there's spear fishing, which is like a whole nother world. Fuck, um, yeah. done that a handful of times. There's hunting here year round, which is why we vacationed here and what we like to do. Um, and like I said, there's people visiting. It's nice to be able to just like spend time with, with people that are here and not have to worry about, you know, showing up to, to a job. And then, um, like I I'm going back to uh to California um for like a month. Um so I'm going to be able to to hang out at the school quite a bit and hopefully make some different types of 
videos while I'm there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's just like, it's crazy. And like, we've even talked about like maybe for a honeymoon, like going around. Cause my, my fiance is like really into golf and I'm really into jujitsu. So it'd be fun to like drive like across the country and visit like different YouTubers gyms um and train jujitsu and make youtube videos with them and then like golf at different golf courses around the country you know and like yeah. if we were able to do that that'd be pretty cool i don't know it's yeah. just like it it just opens up doors you know um mm-hmm. yeah some some friends that you've grown up with uh or maybe some college mates uh do you still keep in touch with these people from your yeah um i would say some college uh roommates i Mm -hmm. I keep in touch with um most of my friends from back home um not not so much um and like it's kind of like when i met my fiance i was like yeah yeah, we're going to i'm going to like a a party um it's like with a bunch of like 40 year olds because like these are mostly my friends now from jujitsu you know (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah, I would say that I've kind of stuck on a uh, a little bit of a narrow path, if that makes mm-hmm. sense, um, mm-hmm. which didn't lend itself too much to going out and uh, partying and, and doing social encounters uh, with, yeah. with people that are, you kind of need to, to keep those relationships alive. And honestly, it wasn't necessarily what I was trying to accomplish like at the time, you know, so um yeah, kinda. I guess I'm just I'm asking because I wanted to get a sense of if people your age are just grasping these tools a little bit more. There's never been a there's never been a better time to to create right uh, content. And I what guess a time to be know, alive. <laughs> yeah, what a time to be alive. I mean, you could just really just stay home and learn things and get enough experience and then cast it out to people, and right. people will support. It's like such a great way to just trade what you know for what other people know and yeah no um i'm i'm definitely unique from my friends um in the sense that like i don't know anyone else really doing this you know um and like i said it just kind of was a way for me to journal over covid and it turned into something that i'm pursuing at this point but i'm just kind of learning as i go i don't really have someone guiding me um yeah or anything like that so i'm sure i'm gonna step in some some potholes along the way <laughs> yeah but yeah. uh yeah we'll cross but i think that's great because if you go to like other youtube you know i'm pretty sure you're getting in touch with these people um some that who are pretty well known i'm sure i can even think of some off the top of my head yeah if you definitely link up with those guys that could definitely spurt a little bit a lot more growth from yeah for your stuff too for sure. And like just along the along the like self-learning lines, like I think just like in general, like I started jujitsu at a at a school um where it was very like old school and like taught a lot of old kind of style of technique. Mm. And I just felt like I wanted more, you know. So that required me to do a lot of studying on my own. And then I saw Mike's, you know teaching style and the, and the techniques he was doing and i went into that school as a purple belt and got heel hooked like 15 times by white belts and uh i was like man i need to learn this stuff you know and right. i just think uh like you can take things into your own hands and figure it out you know like now it's 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 just a crazy time to be alive like people like you don't have to be a victim of your of your circumstances you know like mm-hmm. you can like this example I saw was like, you can either blame schools for not teaching you finance or you can go out and learn finance. Like mm-hmm. it is what it is. You know, what are you going to do about it? Kind of thing, oh, yeah. you know? Yep. Um, so I think the having, having no mentor or having like a, a like a, a decent mentor, but you like want more is like a good, it's almost good for your long-term growth, I feel like, because it forces you to go out and like find answers yourself instead of relying on someone to constantly give you the answer, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, yeah. yeah, and that's what I'm starting to learn um, just even from guests on this, you know, this whole podcasting bonanza, I guess. <laughs> it's, 
one guy said that he purposely sets up people to fail so that they could just learn on their own and right. get the answers that way. And I was like, what a concept to teach that way, you know? Right. Um, can, can Hold that thought. I would love to explore that a little bit more. Are you doing okay on time? Yeah, I'm good. I got, I got a flexible schedule. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> flexible schedules. Um, let me, use, can I use the restroom really quick? Yeah, I'll go be for right it. back. All yeah, right. No rush. Thanks. All right. Sorry about that. No worries. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Learning jujitsu and all the modern stuff and getting answers, right? What a time to be alive. Um, <laughs> I feel like, uh, how, do you think all schools are kind of embracing that kind of new, new age stuff um, and not teaching the old stuff because of how much content is being put out? by people like BJJ fanatics or anything like that? I honestly am, I don't know. <laughs> I've only, you know, been to two schools and uh, now I'm on a remote island in the middle of nowhere. Um, right. So I, I honestly don't know. Um, I like to think so, but I yeah. I doubt it, honestly. It, it just seems that, you know, I'm thinking of just, I'm, I'm very out of touch with, modern jujitsu competitors after the right the dan or her death squad but there's these kids the Rito rotolo brothers and i think they're what barely 21 years old i think so yeah if yeah that. and they they've got their their black belts already right right i mean they're really good yeah i guess okay coming from that idea that belts really don't matter but i mean if you're competing at a high level that's got to be because of these ideas that are being exchanged over sites like BJJ Fanatics and your channel. I mean, ideas that are being exchanged and then the counter to the counter, you know, it's just an endless rabbit hole. Right. Yeah. No, um, Gordon Ryan, who's like considered the best no gi grappler, mm -hmm. always he's, he was asked the question of why, like he, he makes instructionals pretty much outlining his whole game plan when he's competing right and then still beat you you know so basically he was asked how is that possible right like how are you literally showing people what you're doing and you're still beating them with like the exact thing that you showed them and he basically said the older generation doesn't even watch the videos and you'll if you watch like the they call it adcc which is like the olympics of jiu-jitsu they have it every two years and you have to go to a trial to qualify for that. And typically, there are younger people at those trials. And he said, if you watch the trials, you're going to see a lot of the stuff that I'm teaching in my instructionals. But if you watch the older competitors that I'm competing against, you're going to see the old style of jujitsu, which, right. you know, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, it just depends what your goals are, right? Are your goals to be able to defend yourself in a street fight? Or are your goals to be to win at the highest level of jujitsu, you know, the completely different goals. And, uh, if your goals are to compete against the highest level of jujitsu athletes, you're going to have to keep up with the latest and greatest stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If we're going to talk about learning and mastering a skill like jujitsu, or, you know, you talked about wanting to pick up some things along the way because of the flexible that would result from a flexible schedule. Um, you know, I remember when I was like, you know, approaching 30, I started to begin to grasp, um, you know, what a sense of what it takes to master something or to pursue mastery, like the, the Japanese shokunin. You've, I'm pretty sure you've heard of that, right? Like, yeah. it's just like a lifestyle. And, um, you know, with the, de with the time that you devote to, um, you know, observing, learning um, from pretty much masters in competition, um, do you feel like the approach to learning jujitsu is a great tool for, for learning and, and teaching in general, pretty Definitely. much on a, on a big scale? Definitely. Um, I, I'm kind of reading, I'm working my way through this book called the talent code. Have you read it? Mm, no, no. Yeah. So I'm still kind of working my way through it. So I imagine I might be a little scatterbrained here while I'm explaining this, but, uh, yeah, yeah. basically they ran a study where they took screenshots of different like famous chess games and they asked 
the they they posed the the question to chess masters and to just beginner chess players they took screenshots like say 10 screenshots and they asked them to put the pieces on the board exactly where they were right and they weren't able to look at the picture obviously they just had to do it from memory and the chess masters were able to put the pieces very close if not perfect to where they were right. on the board where the beginners just didn't do it at all like they were just terrible right Mm -hmm. and then instead of taking screenshots from actual chess games they just put the pieces randomly on the board so there was no order to the pieces no rhyme of reason to the pieces and then they asked the chess masters to do it again and the beginners to do it again and this time there was no difference between the chess masters or the beginners so the memory of the chess masters isn't what's setting them apart it's their ability to understand the pattern of the chess game right and be able to recognize the position so if you say like half guard to someone like a jiu-jitsu person is going to be like yes this is half guard and they're going to be able to put themselves in half guard but if you just say half guard to like someone or just show them half guard they're going to be like "Uh, i don't really know what the heck is going on you know so like (laughs) being a master in anything is just being able to recognize the patterns and then break it down into smaller and smaller pieces, you know? So I feel like that can apply to anything, you know, like Mm. the example that John Donaher always gives is um, like Eskimos, how they have like 27 different words for snow, you know, Mm. depending Mm. on the type of snow it is. Whereas like a normal person would just be like, yeah, it's snow, you know? And it's just their level of mastery and they pretty much have to, otherwise they're going to, you know, die if they're not able to distinguish the the different types of snow right so the level of mastery comes from the ability to recognize patterns and break it down into smaller and smaller pieces so Mm. yeah yeah i think that's amazing um and as far as teaching goes uh yeah do you think that applies the way a class is structured um even how you know repetition um what else drilling i guess does that do you feel that that applies to everything else too or at least to the things that you would want to learn yeah definitely i think um there has to be an intentional in approach to it you know you can't just be like i want to do a hundred arm bars and then do a hundred arm bars and think you're going to be like amazing at arm bars you know Mm -hmm. but like the way i think mike does it is super super like I, I really enjoy the way he, he structures it where it's kind of like a, like, for example, I know you, you're probably going to get this example, but like no one in the audience is probably going to get this example, but That's like, great. That's great. If you start from like the back and you have their arm trapped and your hand like around their neck. Right. And it's like, okay, now all you got to do is extract your other arm and then lock in your rear naked choke. You know, mm-hmm. you should be able to do that like hundred percent of the time. So now that you have confidence that you can get there, then start to work your way backwards. So now maybe you don't have the arm trapped or maybe you do have the arm trapped. You just have to get underneath their neck. And then once you can do that, then you work your way back. And now you got to trap their arm, but you have confidence. Once you trap your their arm, you're going to be able to finish, you know? Right. And Donaher, I think it all honestly stems from this mastermind of Donaher. But like mm-hmm. he basically said, like, if I teach someone how to break someone's leg from inside Senkaku, if they don't know anything else, right? But they are 98% sure if they get to that position that they're going to finish, you know? Yeah. It gives you yeah. hope. So like if you're getting smashed on the bottom of side control and you have hope that like, man, if I can get to this position, I'm going to win this match, then yeah. you're going to you're gonna fight to get out of there, right? You're going to fight that choke that's almost got you because you know if you get out, you can get to your position potentially and yeah. win. You know, if you don't yeah. have that hope, then you're, you're not going to fight. You don't have any, any, any chance. So, um, I think just the, the way Mike teaches it gives you confidence, you know, like I know Mm -hmm. I might not be able to, you know, understand what's going on in this position, but if I can get out and get to my position, I know I, I understand what's going on here and I, I have confidence that I can win, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's, it's crazy because, halfway through drilling i'm just like how am i going to remember all this right and then it's like okay everybody get into positions we're going to do positional sparring 
And then all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, I'm, I'm doing it. (laughs) You know, I don't know. It's just, I, I try to think about these concepts, especially when it comes to teaching and learning and how they can be applied to, yeah, a classroom setting because, you know, I've been around kids a lot more in, in helping support other teachers and at, at a school and also just in the future of communication is teaching, um, definitely, uh, learning, even learning, even communicating your learning at the same time. So I don't know. I, I, I'm just trying to play with these ideas and, and it's interesting that you've taken learning outside of the mat and the gym and you brought it home. So you're just kind of like always working these ideas in your mind. And it's like, yeah, I just think that that's a fascinating, it's a fascinating practice. And I know a lot of top level athletes do it. Um, you know, Kobe Bryant, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knows Kobe. Uh, he has a, he has a, a series on YouTube when he, when he was still alive, um, it was called detail and he would detail the, the basketball games and the little tiniest nuances of where somebody's foot is pointed at in relation to, have you played basketball before? You play uh, baseball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was kind of like that. And I was just like, wow, this is entertaining. Like, even though I don't know much about basketball other than playing it at a playground, I just love the practice of somebody sitting in front of a, a screen and just studying. I don't know. I, I find that very entertaining. It could be anything as long as there's enthusiasm involved with it. I feel like but, uh, you appreciate it because you're you're pro- like an amazing cook right and you know mm. the the time it took for you to master all those ingredients and like the little details that go into making a dish the way it tastes right and right. you you might not understand like exactly what kobe's talking about but you can appreciate the amount of effort that he's put into that craft you know right and, yeah and it's almost like if you know something well enough it becomes almost like poetry the way even the way top level like black belts teach jujitsu if they're a great communicator and they're teaching great technique i just love being in that setting where everybody's like locked in everybody's paying attention and engaged and and there's you know i guess the difference between a brown belt and a black belt i've also heard is the way people com- the way they communicate ideas right and the way you have to be able to, to com- yeah i'm just i don't know i nerd out on that kind of stuff so yeah <laughs> no i think uh i think the the biggest thing to kind of like transfer knowledge from like jujitsu to like the world right like how to how to do it it's, it reminds me of i remember you talking to me um about that sunk cost example um, yeah. from class yeah. and i got it from donaher so But like the idea is like if you're in jujitsu and you have like an underhook from half guard, right? So we can stick in with half guard. You have an underhook from top half guard. It is an asset until they can put their knee in and now they have a knee shield. And now that underhook could very well like be a liability. You could put you in a triangle like really quickly because Mm. they have that knee shield in now, right? So like it's... It's just the understanding that like, even though you worked hard to get that underhook, you have to, there has to be some level of acceptance when that underhook is no longer serving you. Right. And just the, the principle of that acceptance, you have to, you have to understand the technique on the level of principle to be able to transfer it outside. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Stand underhook and knee shield. You have to, <laughs> you have to understand yeah. the, the principle behind it. Right. I'm just like so amazed at how people could apply uh, their different backgrounds into something totally different. Uh, Like, let's just say, yeah, philosophy, Um, and then just apply it to learning something like jujitsu. Right. There's just just a point. Yeah, it's amazing. And I I just feel like it's, uh, it's something that you can apply. I mean, we can apply a lot of our own experiences to a lot of things. Um, And specifically, I guess I'm thinking about philosophy um, and applying that to even jujitsu is just, 
yeah, such a great learning tool. I don't know. Um, right. Learning, but, learning how to think, right? Learning how to think. Yeah. Is that, is that coming from you or me? Yeah, that's me. Sorry. Oh, shoot. We got Sorry, a, uh, we go. got a dehydrator. We're making a bunch of snacks here now. Like we get Heck like, yeah. free bananas and apples from the cafe. So we're making like banana chips and apple chips. Oh. And then like with some venison that we got, we're making some jerky and, and stuff like that. So dude snacks <laughs> that how perfect is that that was just the what i was about to get into next right so i guess the whole point of why i'm starting this why i've started this uh um podcast, podcast. yeah uh it's i don't know i just wanted to learn what it means to be resilient, you know, hmm. especially what it felt like in the beginning of 2020 when the pandemic first became a reality, I guess. It just started to feel like we were just on a very thin thread of chaos, between chaos and and c- civility, I guess you could say. You know, it was hard to even get groceries at one point. Mm-hmm. And I know, you know, too. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to focus from now on, you know, all about teaching and learning, problem solving, and even flexibility, like what you're doing is, is really valuable. And uh, yeah, so I guess what I wanted to ask you is uh, the, the, the wilderness skills and the hunting skills, what, what led you to wanting to learn those things? It kind of st- I've always been like a very health conscious per- person, hence the like microgreens and everything in the living room. <laughs> yeah. um, and just the idea of being able to harvest your own meat was the reason pretty much I got into it. And then um, my girlfriend, she um, had like a background and really enjoyed backpacking and camping. Yeah. So a lot of times to, to hunt, you have to do that. That's a big aspect of it, right? You got to hike back 10 miles into the the mountains before you can find an animal kind of thing. So, um, it was just a nice way for us to enjoy the outdoors while trying to, to harvest our own meat. Right. But at the same time, it's like, you're not just going on a hike, you're going on a, a hike with a purpose of it, you know, and you're going on a hike in a place where you're trying to avoid people and, like it's, it's very remote, right? Like you don't want other people in your hunting spot. So you have to be self-reliant and I am definitely still definitely am not, um, I don't have the confidence to, to be self-reliant in a situation where like, if your car breaks down and you're six miles out, like, what do you do? You know, like Mm. you just kind of have to plan for a lot of worst case scenarios. So, um, just for the the peace of mind for like her parents going out with, with me, you know? Um, and just like for myself, obviously I just tried to learn a little, um, like not tying skills. So like you can hang your food. So bears don't get your food. You can like just be, yeah. Like there's a lot that goes into it, you know? Um, it's not just going out and, and shooting an animal or anything like mm-hmm, that. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that was the idea was just to be more health conscious about meat. Um, but there's there's a lot of skills that go into the ability to um, harvest your own meat. So, um, yeah, that was that was the mindset behind it. Mm-hmm. And wow. Uh, and being health conscious about where you source your meat. Is that what you were? Is that what you just said? Yeah. And and just like the nutrient density of it. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm hmm. What are you, what are you, what's your practice on how you consume meat? I'm just curious. Cause you're, you know, if you're practicing how to hunt and get your own from these sources. Right. I'd, I'd like to say that I only eat meat that I harvest, you know, but that's definitely mm-hmm. far from the truth. Um, and right now we don't have like a kitchen or anything. We live in a hotel room. So, um, we're kind of just subject to the food that they, they feed us in the cafeteria, um, which tends to be uh like a lot of you know meat and vegetables so we have like a little single burner 
stove out here mm-hmm. that we bought on Amazon. It's like a little electric stove for like eighteen dollars mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, and we'll like fry up some some venison and put it on a salad kind of thing if if we want to do that. Um, but a lot of times we just kind of eat what they what they give us and have like a little um, like green mixture that we eat, you know, and, and uh, some vitamins that we take to make sure that's that's taken care of. But yeah. I'm interested right, nice. about your your diet. What do you what do you? Um, oh you uh, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I've been playing a lot with because I'm just like a naturally big dude. I can walk around easily at 180, um, and that's even with like diet restriction and things like that. But I've been playing with the last six months of uh, with fasting, mm-hmm. uh, and mostly I would say 80 percent plant based. Gotcha. Um, so a lot of beans, legumes and less meat because I, for some reason I get really tired when I eat grocery store <laughs> bought meat, right. uh, and just meat in general. And it's really made me like just keep a lot of excess weight off. And I also consume, uh, uh, athletic greens. Just gotcha. because sometimes I'm just so busy, I can't even cook vegetables. You got to get them to sponsor the podcast. I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just mention them enough, right? Yeah. And then, uh, but other than that, uh, it's kind of weird because, yeah, I, I've tried pale- the paleo diet. I've tried all those kinds of, and this one's just kind of worked out for me. I don't like, I don't know. Do you take naps at all? Um, Try not to. Um, yeah. Yeah. But. With the flexible schedule, sometimes the <laughs> yeah, the mind yeah. gets the better of you. So yeah, yeah, sometimes I do. Okay, okay, yeah. But I also wanted to get that get eventually there uh, with with I don't know hunting and fishing for my own food, but just don't have the time. Just right, meeting people maybe that do it. But you had the chance to do that, right? Like you bagged a or you you had a chance to harvest a deer. Yeah, no, here um, on the island, you can go hunting year round and kind of a, it it sounds like absolutely terrible, right? Especially coming from the mainland. Um, But these deer, there's 30,000 deer on the island and there's 3000 people. And these deer are literally starving to death. And like around the golf course, it smells like a zoo, right? There's just like not enough food on the island to sustain the amount of deer that there are on this island. So, um, if nothing is done to control the population, because there's no predator, there's no bears, there's no mountain lions here. There's no nothing that kills these deer. And there's an organization that's in charge of managing the natural resources of the island. And they go around at night and they shoot deer and they deliver them around town to people who want meat. So you can go place an order with them and they'll shoot a deer for you and you have to butcher it and everything yourself. But basically that is a source of food for the people here on the island. So that if if you're willing to put in the effort, you can have as much deer meat as you want living here. So that Holy is super shit. crazy. Yeah, exactly. It just like blows Holy your mind, especially if you're from like, <laughs> yeah, like a city, you know, it just doesn't that make is- any sense. That's mind blowing for sure. Yeah. How did the deer get there? And you're on Lanai? Yeah. It's right next to Maui. Um, Yeah. Wow. So. Okay. um, The deer got here. I'm going to butcher this, but um, it was a gift to the emperor of the island. And the deer are from India and they're super pretty deer. They're called axis deer and they breed year round. Um, so like in California, a deer will typically mate once a year and it's typically in November, but these deer mate year round and there's no predators or anything like I previously said. So their population is just out of control and like they'll be running into cars and like everything. It's just, it's just a mess here. Um, Fuck. Wow. and it, it's definitely something that needs to be managed. And it's kind of like, honestly, like a paradise if you're a bow hunter, right? Cause you can just go year round and it's a destination for people. Like there are really big names that come here just to hunt, you know? Okay. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about it through Joe Rogan. That's where we heard about it. 
And mm. uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a destination for a lot of um, people in the in the hunting world. Have you ever uh, had a chance to use your bow on? Yeah, I've uh, gotten two okay. deer while we've been here. Um, and wow. then we've gotten one from that organization that I've talked about. We just okay. order it and they, they deliver it. But living in the hotel, we kind of got to be a little incognito about uh, okay. butchering deer and stuff yeah. <laughs> without a sink and everything. It gets a little uh, it's a little gray area we try not yeah. to, to tell people about. But yeah. Uh, what's the feeling like when you're bagging your first deer? Yeah, like um, it's heavy. It's it's uh it's heavy and uh it's it's hard to describe honestly like it's a feeling you work so hard to get there and to have that opportunity and so many things have to go right for you especially with a bow to get a shot on an animal and then especially these deer like there are so many things that can go wrong. Like once the shot happens, they can hear your bow and then like take a step forward. And then now instead of killing the animal, you're injuring it. And now that's like worst case scenario. Right. And like, it's just like so many variables. And then for you to actually get one down successfully, like you're so excited, but at the same time, it's like, do you realize what you just did kind of thing, you know? Like yeah. the, it's just such, it's such a weird feeling of emotion, you know? Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of hard to, to describe and kind of put your finger around it. And like, my eyes are starting to water a little bit, just even like talking about it, but like, it's, uh, it's heavy, man. It's, uh, like, like looking into an animal's eyes that you just killed, you know, it's, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's not, it's not anything to take lightly. For sure. Yeah. Um, But I think it just like really it puts into perspective like, dude, you're not just going out and like picking up some pork at the grocery store to throw in your like. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like it's it's heavy stuff and you you earned it and it just makes it taste that much better, you know, and like it it's it honestly like it's not going to taste it tastes way different, you know, than than like beef and stuff. So when you give it to people and they try it, they're like, huh it's all right. Like whatever. It wouldn't be my first choice. It's like, dude, you know how hard I had to work to get that? Like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I thank you for sharing that, man. Um, because I didn't mention why I, <laughs> I, I went mostly plant-based because, uh, this has happened twice in my life. And the second time I was just kind of like, ah, oh, shit. You know, I was watching this, uh, Anthony Bourdain, he visited Portugal And, uh, he attended a feast, uh, you know, where there was a live pig served and they showed everything up to the point where the pig was shot in the head. And, uh, I've, this has happened. Yeah. This is my second time that this has happened. And I'm just watching on TV, just hearing the animal struggle. Um, it brought me to. Us, like I was sobbing right after it happened. I was like uncontrollably sobbing. And I guess just hearing suffering. Um, yeah. And so it just made me rethink um, that whole relationship with the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and it's sacred, man. I really feel like, um, you know, your experience with the deer is that's, that's beautiful. Uh, and I feel like if I'm going to continue to eat meat, which I still do, um, I just need to be a little bit more conscious about like, whoa, uh, it happens all the time in the animal world, how, uh, people just give, not people, but animals give their lives to help feed another, right. Another life pretty much. And so, wow, you know giving your life so that somebody else can live. I, I think, yeah, I don't know. There's it's philosoph it's very philosophical, right? But it's also just something that needs to be acknowledged. And yeah, I think that's cool that you, that you go out and get your own fish, you get your own venison. Yeah. Paradise. I mean, it's not like, I don't want to make it seem like it's like the only thing I eat, you know, like we, we right. definitely eat our fair share, but it definitely mm. gives you a different perspective on it for sure. Yeah. Do you use the skins at all? You know, people do, um, mm-hmm. but like honestly here, 
there there's so many of them that like mm-hmm. there are some portions of meat that are more preferable to other portions of meat on the animal right Mm -hmm. um like you can have a filet or you can have like you know a ground beef you know Mm -hmm. so typically like there's so many deer here like you even see people like just taking like the cut choices of meat um and because it's like a lot of effort to go through all the the other stuff and it sounds like i'm saying it just sounds terrible right but like when you're here and you see it and it's like, dude, you can't even golf without like smelling like a zoo. Like they're literally just dying. They're on the side of the road, just dead, you know, cause there's oh, not enough food shit. and like you, they need to manage this population and it's feeding the people here. And it, it, like I said, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to make it. I'm not trying to fluff it up. I'm chilling, telling you what yeah, it is, you know? Yeah, and like yeah. people, people will take the, the choice cuts and leave the the non desirable less desirable meats you know um just because there's so many of them and we we don't do that just because we don't we're not as successful as other people right and like we try and take the the amount of like the most meat we can get kind of thing you know yeah um but at the same time uh we we yeah yeah we we try to uh to savor those nice nice steaks and then make like jerky and stuff with the the less Mm. less desired cuts yeah yeah because i imagine they can last you for a really long time right yeah it's it's, it's a decent amount it's like like probably like a month and a half maybe like Mm -hmm. per deer Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how long does it take to to feel confident enough to grab your bow and and go out and find a, a deer yeah man it's uh I still don't feel like a hundred percent confident to be honest. And like, everyone's going to have like a, like a range where it's like, I need to be within 40 yards to take like an ethical shot on this animal. Right. And it can be like, it can be varying. Like, yeah, my, my range is like 40, but like today's kind of windy and like my feet are not level here on this shot. And like, it's, there's so many variables, right? So it's like, okay, maybe it's my limit's 40. I feel super comfortable at 40. I'm like pretty confident I can hit it at 50, but like it's windy, whatever. I feel like 25 is my max today. You know, Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. it just like, there's so many variables and it's kind of the same as jujitsu, right? Like you can practice a technique a hundred times without any resistance, but when you do it with resistance in like actual live speed, yeah, like it, it's different, you know, like like your heart yeah. is going, your adrenaline's going, you're not in your backyard shooting a 40-yard shot, you know, you're literally about to take a shot on an animal and your aimer's like going up and down, you can't like control your heartbeat, you know? So there's been multiple times where I've like drawn back on a on a animal and like I can't get my heart rate to calm down and like I just let down my bow and a lot of times, honestly, when I let down, it kind of like piques their interest a little bit like what was that yeah and uh they might not necessarily like run but they'll be on Mm -hmm. alert you know and if they're on alert it's uh it's much harder to take an ethical shot like if some if like an animal's not on alert and has like no idea i'm there i'll feel confident taking a 40 yard shot because i'm pretty confident that it's not going to jump forward when Mm -hmm. i shoot Mm -hmm. you know but if it kind of knows something's up and you take a 40 yard shot, these, these animals are going to jump forward. So now instead of hitting it where you want to hit it, you're hitting it in like the butt, which it's not going to kill it. And now it's like worst case, you know? So like if you, it's just a lot, a lot of variables, you know? So I would say for me, before I actually went out with the intention of hunting with my bow, it was like four months of solid, solid practice. Yeah. Wow. And that's like what, twice three times a week um it was during covid honestly and i would just shoot every day during my lunch break so it was like a half hour every like every day yeah wow okay okay i gotta look into that um no if you uh, if you want a bow i have an extra one um back home yeah i mean we're about the same size yeah it would it would work great for you i'll take i'll take i might take you up on that yeah for sure um and I imagine too that when you're you're stalking these deer, right? Before, is what's the level of skill of stalking like? Oh, uh, man. especially at the at the island. 
dude, like these deer are hunted year round and okay. they're only predators, humans, you know? So like if they see a human, if they smell a human, if they get an idea of a human is in the area, they're gone, you know? They're gone. So oh, damn. They basically say this is like a, like a boot camp, like a training ground for, for deer hunting, you know, and stalking mm -hmm. deer. And the actual shooting of an animal is like such a small percentage of what hunting is, you know, like yep. it's, it's all understanding the wind, understanding there's these things called thermals where like, if you're on a hill and heat rises, right? So like in the morning, when the sun hits the bottom of this valley, the air that's getting heated up is going to go up the hill. So mm even though the wind might be going down around 8.30, we figured out here, that's when the thermals start to pick up. And then you're going to get an up like draft of wind um, mm -hmm. from the thermals in the morning. And then the opposite happens in the evening. So it's like a lot of just understanding nature and the way like nature moves, right? And and habits and patterns, right? Of, of nature. Yeah, yeah. That sounds amazing. Uh because, uh, yeah, I, I say it a lot, uh, on this podcast, it's, it's just things about our natural innate ability to sense things that we've lost touch with. So I never, I've never heard modern hunting, uh, until recently, um, described in that kind of experience that you just laid out it's yeah that's that's amazing uh that you get to tap back into those uh resources uh that were evolved to experience for sur i wouldn't even say survival it's just more kind of like to connect with nature almost that's what makes um, it even more way. weird right it's like you're yeah. you're doing it not for survival you're just going out and shooting an animal it just yeah, it's, yeah yeah it it sounds bad but mm. um yeah there's there's probably a better language that we haven't explored for no that. for sure uh, and yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the way most people would say it but like the way like we talked about earlier is that um you're doing it for like ethical reasons almost you know you don't want to contribute to mm -hmm. you know the the way the the meat is put in a grocery store right and and even if you do um, at least you're aware of, of what that process is, you know? Yeah. Going down the line of resilience, uh, how, how would you, this is a very philosophical question, I guess, <laughs> if I'm good, if I may, um, how, do, how do you define resilience and how would you teach that to somebody that wishes to build that in themselves? Man, that was a good question. I, when you said the purpose of your podcast was to like uh, talk about resilience and become more resilient, I was literally going to ask you what what defines like resilience for you. Um, mm. So I guess I'll answer first, but then I would like to hear your your yeah, response yeah. to this as well. Um, for me, you know, just relating it back to jujitsu again, like I think resilience comes from being kind of like just like a problem solver um in the sense that like i'll teach you how to do like i'll teach you how to do this technique and then i'll teach you how to do the follow-up technique but mm -hmm. if you're not in the exact position that you were in right you're you're rarely going to be in the exact position that you were taught and how do you adapt what you've learned to this somewhat unique situation you know like there's overlap for sure but you don't have 100 percent of like the same you haven't been here in this exact spot 100 percent of the time you know right how do you how do you go about managing that situation and um i think it just comes down to just like we talked about understanding the the principle behind your movements not necessarily what you're doing but why you're doing it right and when you understand why you're doing something you can apply it to so many different aspects of your life. And I think it just makes you a good problem solver and you're going to be able to apply that in, in many aspects and it'll make you, make you resilient. Um, so right. the way I would try to teach that or transfer that 
would be to like when you're when you're teaching to just try and stress the the principles right behind behind the movements um as opposed to necessarily the uh the technical aspect of it which is something that i'm like really struggling with honestly because i'm nerd out on the te- technical aspects right so it's like yeah i, I want to tell you like yeah put your hand this way not this way and it's like makes it this much better blah blah blah. but like and there is a time and a place for that for sure but like right especially for people getting into it i think it's more important to try and make them problem solvers and like you said like almost make them mess up you know mm, and yeah it would be more beneficial for me to say like instead of telling you like hey it's better if you hold your hand this way than the way you're currently doing it and just to say like hey how is that working for you and you're like hey i find it working great it's like okay have you tried it on someone bigger like maybe it's mm. not going to work on someone and then you'll say like oh no i haven't maybe try it on this person and that person's able to break through it because they're they're bigger and it's not an efficient way to do it and then you might come to me and say like hey I'm struggling. This grip isn't really working for me, like whatever. And then I could show you like, Oh, have you tried this way? And then, I don't know. It just kind of like, you got to kind of let them suffer a little bit, right? Like, like experience <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the the problem a bit before you, mm. you give them the solution. Um, mm. yeah. To, to help kind of teach the way, the way you should go about problems. So, I mean, and honestly, Sorry, I'm going on a little bit of a rant right now. But oh, please go take as much time as you need. Yeah. That's one of the things I really appreciated about training um at the cave. Cause like I I found this like like there was like a an idea um that was kind of like planted in my head, a, a final position to get to. And I found a way to set it up. I thought I did. And then I showed it to Mike. And Mike was like, hmm. I like that. Um, He said, we're going to do situational drilling from the position where I used to set up the final position, if that makes sense. And uh, he was like, we're going to start here, try it on many different body types, and then we'll kind of assess how it works on those body types. And then we kind of found that it didn't really work that well on bigger people because it put them in a pretty good defensive position that they could could exploit. Um, But it wasn't like he said... No, I don't think that would work because you're putting him in this defensive position, which he right. probably knew, you know, he was like, hey, why don't you go try it on like 10 different people and see what you find? And I was like, you know, I found like it kind of worked on like smaller people, but it, they didn't really work on like the bigger people. <laughs> he was like, cool. <laughs> you know, like that's that stuck with me. And like it allowed me to think for myself. It wasn't just him like shooting down my idea right away. It allowed mm. me to come up with a solution and then test it and then realize like, hey, it didn't work. But now we can go back to the drawing board and it didn't it didn't make me reconsider my next idea and if i should go to him with my next idea or not you know like i'm 100 percent still trying to think of ideas now because he gave me the the freedom to do that does that make sense right yeah yeah so yeah, i think that he, that's a really important like trait to try and pass on as a teacher for sure wow wow yeah just to have people learn for themselves rather than spewing an answer that whoop, people will probably forget right but it makes you feel good as the person spewing that answer right you're like yeah i got all the answers kind of thing right yeah (laughs) yeah right 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 that's a good point that's a good point i love that thank you for uh answering so what what is your definition of of resilience oh wow that's funny that you ask you're the first person that's turned around these questions on me and uh it's funny because i i'm like these are like these are questions that I haven't even thought about myself sometimes, but okay, here it is. Um, I guess it depends on the day that you ask me. Mm. Um, What is resilience? I feel that it's such a multifaceted term. And, um, but if I could just briefly talk about it, it's, so I see resilience and self-reliance as the same thing. Um, but maybe, maybe that's not it. Maybe it's more of one. Sometimes you need to collaborate. Sometimes you need to figure things out on your own. And maybe it is flexibility. And maybe 10 years ago, I would have thought that it was, yeah, you got to like be strong. You got to be tough. You got to persevere and you got to just, 
But honestly, I think resilience is more of a self-awareness and how to how to recognize these things that maybe your body is telling you something and your mind is telling you one other thing, but what's the best, uh, what's the best solution to the problem that you're trying to solve? Does it require softness or does it require being tough? Does it require uh, collaboration or does it require to just isolate yourself and really focus in on something? Um, I guess that's the, the, the broad term. Um, but what I really feel like resilience is, is, uh, <sighs> mm, yeah, being self-sustainable, um, and knowing what it takes. And I used to think that it was, I used to think it was, um, yeah, it took strength, mental toughness, but I really, I'm starting to grasp this idea of more like, you just need more love and gratitude and and an awareness that sometimes you can't do shit on your own. It does really take other people, I right. guess. But I thank you for letting me rant on that too. No, I'm pretty sure I could have I, I could have gone on more, but um, I guess that's what it is today. Yeah, yeah. I I think about that all the time, and um, and I like what you said earlier too. You said you mentioned something about intention, and you know, when you're doing a move or you're teaching something or you're learning something, you mentioned something about intention that, um, yeah, that I like. And I think intention is very important every day. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Along uh, those, I got the, the intention idea, um, mm -hmm. from Gordon Ryan. I'm just like in love with these guys, but, um, yeah, yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, he talked about how that, like for his first few years in jujitsu, he tried to go to like as many classes as possible, right? Like three, four classes a day. And he felt like that was very beneficial to him because it kind of teaches your body how to move in jujitsu, mm-hmm. right? You're just getting reps of things. But when you're actually trying to like get better at like jujitsu, jujitsu, like once you understand the movements and you just want to beat the top 1% of people, your training session stops when your mind shuts off, right? Like you're no longer getting better and you already understand how to move. You already understand all the movements you're, you need to be mentally focused, right? Mm -hmm. So what he basically said is it's super beneficial to train as many times as possible when you're first starting out. But after you kind of understand all of that, it's kind of more beneficial to just go to like one or two sessions a day and make sure you're a hundred percent there for those sessions as opposed to going to four sessions and just kind of like it all being a blur. Right. Right. So, um, just having like very like, um, intentional practice, right. And Mm -hmm. going into a a session with a, with a purpose. And a lot of times that, that purpose is going to be like more vague or, um, like, like one thing I I've been kind of experimenting with recently is, um, the idea of that purpose being a principle. And this mm-hmm. came from um, the the Gracie brothers. Um, and their idea is that instead of focusing on a submission or like a successful execution of a technique, focus on the execution of a principle. So if the principle is like off balancing someone to set up your move, focus mm-hmm. on trying to get their hands to the mat in as many ways as possible. Right. And then if you are in the bottom of half guard and you're able to off balance them 12 times, but then they pass your guard, you won that you, you off balance them 12 times, you know, like change your mindset and you start to understand how that off balancing takes place from half guard, from side control, from guard, from many different positions. And then you start to learn how to capitalize on that once like you get their hand to the mat, but it starts with understanding the principle, right? Right. So like, I don't know, just, just mixing up your intentions and, um, keeping it interesting. Right. Um, it's kind of where, what I'm kind of experimenting with, with now. Um, yeah. With that said too, uh, who, who would be the most, uh, resilient person that, you know, (laughs) since we're on, on the topic of resilience. 
That's a very good question. We can always go back to it if you want to. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'd like to think about it a little more. Yeah, I respect that. Um, what? Okay. I, you know, are, do you consider yourself a, a, a spiritual person? Um, or are you just experiencing to, you know, are you just here for the experience? I consider myself, I guess, to be somewhat spiritual. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Cause I, I don't know, man, it was just such a beautiful, uh, a description of, uh, or when, you know, when you shared that experience with the deer and what it took to get there and how much work it took to, to feed yourselves pretty much and feed others. Um, I don't know. I think that that provides some insight, especially if you killed something with your own hands and, um, were able to nourish yourself later with it. So I guess with that, uh, what are your thoughts on death and suffering? Man, <laughs> deep. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I feel like exactly like you said, we're, we're kind of put here for a greater purpose, right? Um, in the sense that like an animal dying is to nourish another being on this planet right or or we're here to we're here to serve others right in a sense mm. and that goes to death um and at the end of the day like nobody's gonna remember like me or you or anyone like it's like in any even even like people have done like really amazing things like it'll still be like a generalization almost you know like oh the the Spartans did this or like the, like, it's not like a, a person typically, you know? And even like beyond that, like, it's like even forgotten, like millions and millions of years ago. Like, you know, it's just, I don't know. It just seems like it might take longer for you to be forgotten. Some people, but mm -hmm. like eventually it, it goes away, you know? And it's kind of like egotistical to, to think otherwise a bit. Um, mm. So like at the end of the day, I think like, you just want to like, I, I, you said, are you like spiritual or are you um, like just kind of here for the experience kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's a, yeah. I think it's a bit of both in the sense that like you want to create this experience for you yourself um, to help others and like, but the same idea, like when you die, you're, you're, you're being used for like a greater good to, to kind of progress um, mm -hmm. other beings. I feel like your life should be, should be like that too, you know? Um, and death is just like an extension of that. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I love that. Um, you know, our practice on the mat, like there's a flow state, right? Yeah. Um, we all need that flow state. <laughs> we all need that flow state. <laughs> yeah. Um, how would you describe it? And how do you feel like you enter a flow state? I feel like, I feel like the flow state comes when there is no intention, honestly. Like if I show up and I'm like, man, I just want to roll today. Like that's when your mind shuts off and you just like let your body do what your body's going to do. Right. And I don't think I necessarily get better when I enter a flow state, but I think it is just like so beneficial, especially after work. Like, dude, I just want to go and I want to freaking do jujitsu, you know, like I don't want to have to think about getting hands to the mat or like any of this intention, like principal crap. I just want to go roll around with some people and do jujitsu, you know? So like, I think it's, it's super beneficial. And it's one of the, the aspects of jujitsu. I think people love, it's so easy to get into that that flow space mm -hmm. state, especially if you've been around it for a little while, right? You're not like mm -hmm. a beginner and just overwhelmed with details. You just kind of like let your body relax and let it do what it's going to do. Um, and not, not overthink things. So, um, yeah, I think, I think there's good and bad things, right. To, to being in flow. Mm. Yeah. Here, here, man. That was nice. Um, 
all right i guess uh let's leave with this um 10 years from now if you're listening to this what do you want to say to yourself 10 years from now <laughs> same All right, how about this? I'll answer this question with the question mm -hmm. I kind of left pending previously, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 years from now, I guess I would I would hope the person 10 years from now is the most resilient person that I know. You know. So 10 years from now what would So like what would I say to myself now or Sure. I mean, anything you can even, yeah, anything. I just, kind of, it's like an open-ended question pretty right. much. So basically what, I, however I decide to word it, what I would want is myself 10 years from now to be the most resilient person I know. Mm. That's beautiful, man. So meta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What would you, what would you say? Uh, what would I one. say? I mean, I would be 50 years old. Yeah. You know? So you're pretty much talking, let's just say we're all the same people philosophically. Um, you're pretty much talking to your 10, 40 year old self right now. Right. Uh, I'd be 50. Uh, wow. What would I say? Man, you're giving me a taste of my own medicine. Dude, I love it, dude. Are tough. <laughs> yeah, they are tough. Um, I would say, what would I say? I would say just, I hope you're happy. I hope you're loved. I hope you're at peace. Uh, and, and I hope you're still doing whatever it is that you want to do. I mean, I mean, I, I just feel like that's how similar we are in a sense. We're always kind of new. We're always some, doing something new, right? right? Who knows if I'll even be doing this in a year from now i don't know um but yeah i hope when i'm 50 i'm i'm at least healthy enough to still do jujitsu and you know grow with the people that i see that i've trained with um i'm sure I you guess. will man you don't you don't move like a 40 year old you know <laughs> You're, uh, i think that's a that's a testament to how well you've you've taken care of yourself so I yeah you know and i'm definitely something to admire for sure yeah, thanks, man. Thank you for doing this, Jake. Um, your YouTube channel is amazing, man. Um, the way that you put up the ideas and and how much it's grown, I think you deserve it. You know, thanks. you're definitely a student of the game. Um, you're there every day, even on days that I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're there, uh, like especially when we were training at the cave. And I'm I'm looking forward to you, uh, you know, visiting again and sharing the mat with you again. Yeah, for sure. Can't wait. Yeah, man. Um, anything else? Anything else that you uh, wanted to get across? Or no? Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Sorry, I, I rambled a lot. I got a lot of. I've been um, like reading a lot. Obviously, I have a lot of spare time and stuff, so it's still kind of a little unorganized in my head. A lot of my my thoughts. But thanks for allowing me the 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 time to to work my way through some of the questions man sure. this this that's what this is for i'm not organized in my head and that's what i'm using this for too so you know you're always welcome anytime you want to get something off your chest um and uh yeah just curious what what books are you exploring right now um well it i'm trying to um develop an understanding more of like neuroscience um, and the mm. brain and just like how people learn, how people teach, what motivates people, um, what gets people, you know, excited, how, how basically your body works. Right. So you can understand the, the science behind what's going on when you're learning something pretty much. Um, so I've been just listening to a lot of podcasts and, and things along those lines. Um, I find that stuff really, really fascinating. So hoping to drop yeah. little tidbits as I start to get a little more comfortable with the information um, during my, my videos. Yeah. Oh, cool. Right on Jake. Um, cool, man. I'm, I think we'll end it there. Um, yeah, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for hanging with the tough questions mm -hmm. and, and working through them in your head. Um, 
and giving me a taste of my own medicine. That's for sure. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> any, any books you recommend while we're on that topic? Um, yeah, I have yeah. a few that, um, let's see, I've digested a lot from, uh, Nassim Taleb skin in the game, um, anti-fragile. Nice. Yeah. Um, so have you, have you read those? I have not. I've heard of both okay. of them, especially anti-fragile. Mm-hmm. That's definitely on my list. Um, yeah. I haven't. Yeah. T- talk about resilience. That's right. a good one. Uh, you know, he's, his theory is, uh, things that are fragile become robust when they're exposed to more volatility. That's the whole, pretty much, uh, the, a, a summary, a brief summary of it. Um, I've been digesting a lot of self-help books, mm. um, specifically, uh, yeah, just like interrelational, interrelationalship thingies. Um, my mind is complete mush right now. Yeah. Um, also I've been reading very slowly, uh, game theory. Gotcha. Yeah. It's very dense stuff. And, um, I don't want to bore you with that right now. Game and theory yes. was my favorite. I studied uh, economics in college. That was oh, my cool. favorite class, game theory. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm just diving into that. Maybe we can get into that next time. Yeah, but, for sure. Um, I don't know hey, if you... Best of luck to you. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Say, say, what uh, are you going to say? There's this, uh, this book called um, Mindset by Carol Dweck. I don't know if you've heard of it. No, no. Um you know who Farasa Hobby is? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So I don't know why I didn't think of this before, but um, when we talk about resilience, he basically said um, something that is like uh, fragile or like just like something that can be broken is something like so basically the only way to be anti-fragile is to take the mindset that you're constantly learning right? They are not trying to Mm -hmm. like prove anything or whatever. Um, so like if I'm wrong, it's okay. Cause I'm learning, like you're not breaking me down because I'm wrong. You're encouraging me. So that's like the Mm -hmm. only true way to be like anti-fragile, which is why it reminded me of that. I don't know if that's where he got it from, from that book or whatever, but I think possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I, I know Taleb is like one of those guys that, yeah, he's pretty, influential in terms of um the theories that he puts forth stemming from his experience as a uh options trader gotcha yeah yeah talk about volatility (laughs) talk about volatility yeah yeah and systems i I think it could be said for jujitsu too is that you know the more you make mistakes the more you tap out the 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 stronger your game gets right? right so um yeah that said man thank you so much jake um thank you for your time i really appreciate it yeah thank you thanks everyone for listening check out the quakecityportal.com for show notes and more episodes